and Oz investigation. Fast food containers, paper straws, and plastic tea bags. People are eating about five grams of microplastics per week. In a week? Can these eco-friendly alternatives make us sick? Plus a one-on-one -on -one with Kristen Chenoweth. I didn't know what it was and I couldn't walk. The world was spinning. On her debilitating health battle. Have you ever not been able to perform? Yes. Coming up next. They're the headlines that stop you in your tracks and almost made you lose your lunch, literally. Eco-friendly paper straws showing up everywhere, making you mad, right? But are they also making you sick? How about healthy tea? So good for you. Possibly leaking plastics into your cup. And then there are those new compostable fast food containers. You've seen them all over the place, right? Sort of brownish. May they be causing cancer? Is it better for the environment? Yeah, maybe. But maybe it's worse for your health. We start with that shocking report that materials in direct contact with your food may be covered in questionable chemicals. Take a look. Brand new information about your fast food containers. Do they cause cancer? If you eat out, you know what I'm talking about. A beige, earthy looking receptacle, thicker than paper and thinner than cardboard. A staple at so many restaurants. And though often advertised as eco-friendly, some experts suggest carry out containers may in fact carry harmful chemicals. Today, we're digging into this troubling news. I'm joined by food journalist Joe Fasser with the New Food Economy. He's the one who broke this story and authored the report. An Austin investigator who follows consumer food trends, Ali Rosen, joins us as well. What kind of takeout containers are we talking about specifically and where are we finding them? Right, so we're talking about these plant-based containers. You look at them and they kind of look like an egg carton. You think it's that type of material, but it's a little bit different. You know, when we think about these containers, the companies that are doing this are trying to do better. They're trying to get away from styrofoam. They're trying to get away from plastic. They're trying to respond to consumers' concerns, not just about their health and the food that they're eating, but also in the sustainability of the products that they come with. So that's why this report is sort of so shocking because they were actually trying to do the right thing. So just review this for me. So I, I grew up with styrofoam, right? right. That, that was a problem. We all know about that. They got rid of that. They moved to these plastic containers. Right. These were also concerned because they had chemicals we'll talk about in a second. Mm -hmm. So this is an upgrade in theory. Upgrade in theory, but still. Right. So these fast food places don't have bad intentions. They don't want you to be in danger. But I think it's good that this red flag has been raised, and it was raised by you, Joe. You wrote this article that's got everyone going on... Uh, you know, in different directions on this Bayer issue. What chemicals did you find on these containers and what are you worried about? Sure, so our newsroom, the New Food Economy, tested these eco-friendly, they're called molded fiber containers from a bunch of different uh, fast casual places in Manhattan. And what we found was that 100% of them uh, were highly, um, contain high concentrations of PFAS. So these, describe what PFAS is. Yeah, so uh, PFAS is an acronym actually that stands for this class of about 4,000 chemicals that don't break down in the environment. Um, they're what make nonstick pans nonstick. Mm -hmm. um, you can also find them in stain resistant carpeting, uh, umbrellas. Anytime you want a strong water or grease barrier, um, they're really useful in that ap application. And so that's why they're so handy when it comes to uh, you know, fast food containers. So this is the inside of a, of a container, right? Yeah. And we just put a little oil there just before the show and I'm doing the same thing here. And you'll notice there's a little difference and what's going on here? This is just regular old cardboard. You might have it in dry clean shirt that yeah. comes home, right? This has been treated with one of the PFAS products you're describing. And you notice the oil is, it's not seeping through. It's staying on the surface. Can you all appreciate that? And here's the better part. You wipe it, it's gone, right? It doesn't leave the kind of stain that was left here. So I get completely why it seems like an upgrade for all of us. How widespread is the issue? Yeah, so that's, that's what's great about these from a restaurant's perspective is they're made from plant-based materials, right? And if you, if you uh, just treat that normally, they're going to fall apart if they get in contact with hot or wet food. Right. And so that's why they need to use these chemicals to get the barrier in there. And that's why every single one on the market right now, if you're talking about molded fiber, does contain PFAS. They have to or your lunch will end up in your lap. So I, 
I've heard you refer to these as forever chemicals. Yeah. What makes them forever? They don't break down. Uh, they, you know, in the environment, usually microbes or enzymes or other microorganisms will kind of work on things. These chemicals are so tightly bonded chemically on their molecular structure level that uh, they, they just don't biodegrade. And they also really stick around in the body for a long time. So another chemical of health concern that people have probably heard about, BPA, that stays in the body for a number of hours. Uh, these chemicals can actually have a half-life in the body of months or even years. So they really do stick around inside of us, and that's part of the reason why they're so problematic. So let me show you why PFA's got the chemical name Forever Chemicals. Here's the deal. You toss that so-called biodegradable bowl, right, after lunch, and everyone did the right thing. It just dissolves. It's made of organic material. It disappears, right? But as the bowl breaks down, some experts say the chemicals inside there, they coated it, right? They remain. They never decompose. They leach into the soil, and that soil grows our food, right? All these beautiful plants that grow could theoretically have these these chemicals in them, and they also drain into our water supply, as obviously would happen if it rains, for example. Again, some say it never breaks down there either. And then if they're in our food and if they're in our water, they can end up inside of us. And Joe just pointed out the fact that they can last there for a long time. Now, the industry disputes this, I want to be fair. They say there are not any studies they're aware of that show that these PFAS added to food packaging, transferred to the compost, like I showed. There have been some papers on it, but you know, there's disagreement about it. So what health effects can these chemicals cause in our body? That's fundamentally what I care about as a physician. And the research is very new, but animal studies have shown that it may increase cancer risk. I'm going to put them up here. Not to alarm you, I'm just going to point out that these are potential risks in animals. Increased cholesterol levels, you don't want that. Affects your immune system by making it weaker. Again, not a, not a good thing and can disrupt your thyroid because it's a very sensitive hormonal organ. So if these are theoretical concerns, the next question then becomes, can the chemicals in the containers impact the food inside? Yeah, well, a lot of the scientists I talk to stress the environmental contamination, how it gets into soil and water potentially. But they also can't rule out um, the direct transfer. And this is an area where there really is a need for more study. There is some evidence that, in fact, there may be concern about that. Um, part of what we know about the, the chemicals that are used in food packaging is in the presence of heat, they migrate a lot more easily. So I personally uh, would no longer microwave leftovers in these, in these containers. Um, it's it's also possible that uh, in the presence of certain common commercial food additives, emulsifiers, stabilizers, they've also been short, uh, shown to help these chemicals travel. So there is some, we can't rule direct transfer out at the moment. Just to be fair to industry, I'm going to push back a little bit on this. Yeah, yeah. These guys seem to have gotten rid of all these bad PFAS chemicals, the ones we were complaining about 11 yeah. years ago when I started the show. So they seem to have done the right thing by getting rid of those. Is this a step forward? Haven't, haven't those ones been banned, the old ones? Yes, so uh, starting in the 2000s, government started banning some of the older ones and, and industry, and to their credit, started voluntarily phasing some of them out. The problem is that the newer replacement chemicals have really not been studied and they were deemed to be safe in general because they're less bio-persistent. In other words, they stay in the body for a shorter period of time. But there's actually now new concerns. The latest scientific research shows that these chemicals are actually more bioavailable. And what that means is that they get into the blood more easily and that means they're more likely to sort of suffuse important organs. They also travel more easily in the environment and unlike the old kind which were larger molecules you could screen them out with really good water filtration systems these ones go right through that so the latest research shows actually uh, while the other chemicals were very linked to negative health effects these ones are much more likely to stick around inside our bodies and build up and that's the concern so the fda put out a statement this year saying that in their limited testing they did not have any indication that these substances are a human health concern it's all very new they say but the fda says they're going to continue to do more research to fill in the gaps in the science we get some real questions over here Joe. thank you very much tara and barbara are concerned they use these containers we've been talking about ask away ask away so my question is, I often use these same sorts of bowls to reheat my food in the microwave. Heating it in this, in this container, am I more exposed to these sorts of chemicals? Any thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. You should not be reheating in these containers. Glass and ceramic are usually the best options for the microwave. Mm. Barbara, thoughts? What about my pizza box? I know it's made out of a different material, but what about the chemicals in that? Right, well, this is gonna have the same issue that we saw over there where it's treated with chemicals to make it not leak. So unfortunately, there is not a perfect solution yet. So you do still have to think about your pizza box. Here's the deal. My wife yells at me if I microwave food out of those packaging, but she'll never get a pizza without that lining. 
So we reached out to the Food Service Packaging Institute for a statement. Here's what they said in part. Any product used in food service packaging in this country has, been, has faced rigorous testing by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to ensure that it meets stringent regulations and has been deemed safe. There have also been claims uh, that the use of PFAS will inhibit the biodegradability in packaging, but those claims are false. Consumers can continue enjoying their favorite meals from compostable bowls without concern. Let me just bring Joe back in one second and respond to that. Is it true that there's no evidence that these things are a problem with, with de degradation? So that's a bit of a semantic hedge that I think is important to point out. Yeah, from a material standpoint, these plant-based bowls are actually great. You know, they're, most of them are made from uh, molded sugarcane fibers that are a byproduct of the sugar making process. And that's a fantastically yeah. sustainable thing. And you can give restaurants a lot of credit for wanting to embrace that. that material, the sugar cane, it does biodegrade in the environment. The problem is it leaves behind this chemical residue. So does that mean that the bowl is, is fully degrading? Maybe, but it's really leaving a signature behind that is of concern for our health. So I want to applaud the industry for getting away from materials we know are a problem, but we're replacing them with things that we're not quite sure about. So it's a move in the right direction, but we're not quite there yet. Up next, is there a whole new reason to complain about paper straws? We're finding out if they're actually bad for your health. That's next. Followed, watched, and living in fear. It was terrifying. It was psychological warfare. The stalker she never saw coming. Did you ever suspect that the stalker might be someone really close to you? And a shocking update. I've lost jobs. He sent death threats to bosses. On an infamous celebrity stalker. The Kardashians served their restraining order, and then Gwyneth Paltrow had hers. All new Oz. That's coming up tomorrow. I'm all for saving the environment, but I just don't like paper straws. My coffee shop hands me a sippy cup like I'm some overgrown toddler, but paper straws, worse. To have a tall drink with paper straw is gross, because it kind of dissolves and it adds flavor that you don't want to your drink. The paper straws, they dissolve in my drink. It's just really messy and disgusting. You can put all the stripes and the polka dots you want on it, but it's still awful, it's still wet paper, and no matter how cute it is, I don't enjoy them. As the plastic straw ban continues to spread across cities in America and big businesses like Whole Foods and Starbucks eliminate them from stores, paper straws are having a moment. But if you're unhappy about it, you are clearly not alone. The hate is real, it's palpable. There are even entire Reddit threads dedicated to throwing shade at soggy paper straws. But are they bad for you? Are they bad for your health? Well, maybe. Dr. Rao's team investigator, Ali Rosen, is back. You're still good at food stuff. Yep. From an environmental perspective, is it worth the hassle of getting rid of plastic and using paper straws? So the statistics around this are mind-boggling. In just the U.S., we use 390 million plastic straws every single day. That's more than there are people in the country every day. <laughs> yeah, think about Someone's your using a lot of straws. Right. <laughs> and most of those end up in a landfill or in the environment, and they take up to 200 years to decompose. You compare that to a paper straw, which takes two to six weeks to decompose. Now, there's a caveat here. They're not actually recyclable because you know recycling facilities don't want to take paper waste that has touched water and is sort yeah. of contaminated in their minds. Um, and then there's one other problem with them. As we heard, they're mushy. Oh. <laughs> so you know when you're using a paper straw, you might use two or three of them where you would only use one plastic Are straw. Are these little so. pieces that fragment, they, is that a problem? It's not a problem. They go through your system. You know, they're there, but it's just paper. All right, so what's the real issue? All right, so the real issue here is that it's paper, right? It should look like wood. That's what <laughs> it should start out. But obviously, we don't have paper straws that look like this. They're white, which means they're bleached. So just starting with that, you're adding in chemicals. Right. And then on top of that, we have all the colorful straws. We have the stripes. We have the dots. Um, that also comes with chemicals. So there's no proof that any of this hurts you. But you know, if you're someone who likes to stay away from things like that, it's there. There was one other thing that they add in order to avoid the melting in your mouth syndrome we talked of earlier. That's right. the wax. Right. So they coat them in wax, which is actually a great way to really make them last a little longer. But of course, then that means you're ingesting a little bit of wax. So again, 
No proven harm there, but I'd rather take have, with that what you I'd want. rather have the beating on the surface than melting in my mouth. Right, exactly. Right. But you did something else. You tested several alternatives yes. to both plastic and paper straws. Well, and exactly. It's just there a huge, 390 million straws a day. We could do better than that. What, what do you like? Right, so there's a few different options here. First of all, you have these silicone ones, which are great. You know, they don't, they can stay at room temperature if you're drinking a hot liquid. They're kind of fun, they're colorful. There's also these metal straws. They're cool, some of them come with cases, but I have to tell you, I have a secret favorite version of this. Do you wanna you know do? what it is? Please. Yeah, just don't use a straw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Brilliant insight. You'll be okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you, I've enjoyed this. latest book is called Bring It. Check it out, everything she does is superb. Up next, are tea bags releasing plastic into your tea? Is it possible? They're so good for you, those tea bags. Well, we'll find out. Athleisure wear, trendy, comfy, and moldy? Your sports bra had a germ score, 993. How long is too long to wear your athleisure wear? All new Oz. That's coming up on Wednesday. A new warning to tea drinkers. Could your tea bag be releasing billions, that's right, billions with a B, of microscopic plastic particles into your tea? A disturbing new study finds tea bags sold to supermarkets could be a health hazard. Here to spill the tea on this new science is Chief of Staff of our medical unit and the author of the best-selling book, What to Eat When, Dr. Michael Kruping. So what did the study find? Break it down for us. So we both love tea for all its health benefits, right? And tea is what you want to drink when you want to fight fatigue or help prevent cancer. But the way you make your tea may be important. So this study looked at these types of tea bags, which you see, they're not sort of the traditional type. They're made of plastic, yep. but they're becoming more and more common. And they found that when you soak them in water, they can release more than 11 billion particles of microplastics. And those are really small, right? They're microplastics. So they had to use electron microscopes and lots of techniques, but they showed that they actually were the same type of plastic in the bag and did not come from the leaves. So come on, show me what does that actually mean for the average viewer for their health? Does it really matter? Yeah, so we have plastics everywhere now, right? We get plastics from the water we drink. We get plastics from the food we eat. There's even plastics in beer. There is? Yeah, even in beer. And so we disheartening. Eat, yes. <laughs> Scientists estimate that people are eating about five grams of microplastics per week. Doesn't sound like a lot, but that's about the amount of plastic in a credit card. In a week? Yeah. So You all happy about that? No. It's one way of getting rid of your credit cards. But, but your question is, what does it mean for human health? And the answer is we simply don't know yet. But there are a lot of studies in animals that have some interesting findings. So we know that in mice, the plastics can accumulate in the organs, like in the liver and in the kidneys. In zebrafish, they can change the microbiome, the gut bacteria, and also cause inflammation. And then in this particular study, they looked at something called the water flea, which is a weird little microorganism, and they found it can change their behavior and even cause some developmental changes. Oh my goodness. So, uh, all young to old have to worry about it. So we reached out to the Tea Association of the USA for a statement. Here's what they said in part. They'd like to assure all consumers that tea brewed in tea bags is safe to consume. Materials used to create the tea bags have been assessed by the FDA and other respected independent agencies around the world for their safe use under various conditions of hot food and beverage contact applications. So what does it really mean to have a little bit extra plastic brought into your life? In this study, they, you know, and the organization highlight that there's plastic all around us now. Yeah, so that's what they commented on. There's uh, plastic in our environment, it's everywhere. And, but these scientists did a lot of work to show that this plastic was actually coming from the tea, so it's creating even more plastic. We don't really, again, we don't really know what this does for human health, but it's probably in our best interest to limit the amount of microplastics we're exposed to. Plus you can just you have the tea in other ways, right? So if you're that's concerned right. about microplastics, give me some good alternatives. And you've got a very special hack here as well. Yeah, right. so there's lots of other ways to make tea. You can use those traditional paper bags, or I know you like loose tea, yep. right? So you can put loose tea right into your kettle and strain it out, or you can use one of these tea balls, right? Which is a reusable, environmentally friendly way to do it. You fill it up with your tea, you put it in your cup, and then you add water and let it sit for about 10 minutes and you yep. brew a cup of tea, right? You, if you want something faster than that and you like green tea, which we both do, you can use matcha, right? Matcha is green tea powder, and you just add that to your water, stir it up, and it dissolves almost instantly. So all these make sense, but I learned something as we get ready from this, I always do learn from you. Because I always take my tea, and I'm very religious about this, my wife makes, you know, she gets mad at me. In my house, as I pointed out, my wife, you know, prosecution never rests in my house. So if I leave my tea in this little you know, uh, container for more than three minutes, I get chastised. 
And I know I needed to leave it longer in order to get some of the health benefits out of it. So what's a hack? That's right. So it's really interesting. So most packages of tea say you should just seep it for about three minutes. But scientists did some studies and looked and found that all that good stuff that's in tea that we want to extract, not much of it comes out in three minutes. You actually have to do it for about 30 minutes to get all the benefits. It's impossible. Yeah, now who wants to <laughs> brew their tea for 30 minutes, right? So they came up with a really good trick where you put the tea in the hot water for 30 seconds and then put it in a microwave for one minute and it dramatically boosts the amount of the good stuff in your tea in just a fraction of the time. So do I, should I pull the, 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 this yeah, out? Don't put the metal in there. Oh, it's hot. Whoa, okay. You have to have the leaves in there too. Three, three leaves. Are like, well, I have to leave leaves in there. Yeah. I need the paper type the bags then. Yeah. All right, pa paper bag it, guys. It's worth this. The old fashioned way it'll be effective. We'll be right back. <laughs> Coming up, Tony, an Emmy Award winning actress Kristen Chenoweth this year. We're going to break down the science of holiday movies. Are you addicted to them as I am? Check out the snow. <laughs> So excited. My next guest is a Tony and Emmy Award winning Broadway legend. She dazzled as Glinda, the good witch in Wicked, which is very dear to my heart, and starred in The West Wing and Pushing Daisies. Actress Kristen Chenoweth is here, finally, opening up about how she endured a medical mystery that caused a lot of drama and the secret source of her infectious energy. Here she is now, Kristen. Hi, darling. Now, before we go out, since you're always doing big shows, what is your backstage ritual? Teach me, I can do it. Hey, there's two things I do. Okay. I pray, and then I do I lip travel. You can do it, just go You know what, never do that again. <laughs> Come on, let's go surprise them. Let's go say oh my hi. Goodness. Here she is, Jenna, here she is. Welcome to the show. Well, they love you, like, all, like we all do. And that's why, I tell you, there's so many things that make you special to me. I met Kristen years ago. I, I really was just starting out. We were at an event with Oprah. Yes. And she spoke so highly of you. In private, by the way. You didn't even hear this part. What? And I, I went over. I was enamored. I had seen you on Broadway. Uh -huh. Of course, the show Wicked's about the Wizard of Oz. Like Which the, is your name. Exactly. The, Actually, it's about you. It's about me, sort of. <laughs> just kidding. But when you're recording an album, at that event, you're in the Tabernacle Choir, you have so much infectious energy. Where do you get that from? Well, thank you so much. Um, you know what, it's not everyday perfect, rainbow glitter, you know, unicorn. <laughs> but my mom, I have great people around me that give me a lot of support and love, and I have great friends, and I think that that helps me. Your mom, I, 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 this is what I've been told, you can please correct me. Oh, sure. Apparently, would push on you the fact that you need to be kind Yes. But you need to be truthful as well. And yes. those don't always go perfectly together. No. Why both? I think if you speak your truth and in kindness, people might not agree with you, but they can not get too mad at you. Yeah, they forgive you too yeah. if it happens to be that it's not what they wanted. Yeah, not all of us agree, not all of us agree on everything, right? The, the, the real truth is often between our truths. Amen. So let's get into a deep truth that you shared with the world. Okay. Which again, I treasure you for doing because it sheds light on, on these illnesses. Uh, there's a health issue that, that is, especially as a performing artist at your level, could be critical. Yes. And it's something that affects uh, your hearing. Mm -hmm. the, potentially it creates vertigo. Yes. Uh, it it uh, messes with your balance. Mm -hmm. I mean, lots of stuff. When doctors found what, was, what this was a problem for you, what did they tell you? How did you react? And why did you decide to share it with all of us? It, it is called Meniere's disease, and I know you're aware of it, obviously. Um, I didn't know what it was. I was performing uh, off-Broadway at the Lincoln Center, and I couldn't walk. Uh, the world was spinning, and I don't drink. That's right. <laughs> so I was like, well, what's going on? Finally, I went to a specialist in her ear, and he said, you have Meniere's, and um, you will start losing your hearing. Uh, a lot of it is DNA. It's just, you know, it's passed down, and that is in my family history. Um, a, a sister to it is epilepsy, so I'm lucky that I don't have that as well. But triggers are lights, flashing lights, paparazzi, um, spotlights, interesting, since the, of what I do with my living, it's a, right? It's like someone designed, mm -hmm. Someone thoughtful designed this perfectly as a sniper shot at, at what you do. I know, a sniper from the side. But, and again, my mom said, well, Kristen, and, and actually my doctor worked with me a lot. What I do is I sleep on an incline, laying flat for some reason, 
doesn't work so good. I do a nasal douche. I, I, I excuse me, nasal rinse. <laughs> well, I, I didn't know they existed, but I was about to ask, like, a nasal douche. So do you, where do you buy those? My mother is gonna be so proud of me right now. <laughs> is it your own line of nasal douches? I wish, let's start one. <laughs> Um, no, I get it at Rite Aid. It's Neil Med, like the name Neil Med, and it's like a neti pot. And I also go to my inner ear specialist, and he does exercises with me. Um, and there are some days that I just, here's the thing. If I had flames going across my face, you all would say, oh, no, is she okay? If I had a neck brace or a, a cast, you would say, something's really wrong. But when it's in your inner ear, people think you're having an episode or you maybe are drinking or whatever. And that's the part that's been frustrating. I've constantly felt the need to say, I have Meniere's disease, and people don't really know about it, you know? Have you ever not been able to perform? Yes. And that's been the biggest heartbreak from you because I love what I do. Um, but I have gotten out there uh, many times. For example, I did a Broadway show with Sean Hayes. I did Promises, Promises with him. And I said, I have vertigo real bad. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do act two. He said, I've got you. And do you know that he literally stood and held me up the entire act two so I could finish the show? You've got another health issue that you've allowed me to talk about sure. that is life-threatening for a lot of people mm -hmm. and definitely limits their ability to do simple things like breathing, much less singing and performing and running around on stage, asthma. Can you believe it? It's like, <laughs> here you go, Kristen, have another thing. Um, that that's, sucks for being a performer. Um, I do have asthma. Um, I control it with, um, obviously, rest. We, we, don't, we, don't, we don't talk enough about it. You do. Um, rest, hydration, and I, I do have an inhaler. Flying is not either good for Meniere's or asthma. Oh. Um, what I have found on flights, besides the hydration, hydration, is, um, uh, I don't know if uh, meditation, uh, how uh, y'all you know, think about this audience, but yeah. meditation yes. helps, that helps. We adore it and Slow talk about down. it. Slow down. Come up for a second. I'm gonna yeah. show everyone this asthma animation oh, I'd that love I made. Oh, I'd love to see. So, Here's the basic deal. This is what asthma in the lungs looks like. So a normal airway looks nice and beautiful. And you go down to the trachea, into the little branches of the lungs, you see that it's pristine. The lung tissue's here. The airway's clean. Not a lot of junk in there. But it gets hypersensitive. So sometimes if you take, breathe in, for example, pollen, like that's a bit of pollen right there, goes into your lungs, could be dander, a bunch of things, to airways that are irritated, that material takes those same beautiful airways, and now it causes them to spasm shut. They close shut. They can get mucus in there as well, making it hard for you to breathe, your heart beats faster, right? If you can actually feel chest pain from this as your heart's racing inside of you. You it's can? Oh, I didn't know that. Hmm. Thank you. I, I'm so happy I taught you something. Oh, you did. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Now, up next, Kristen's latest product is something you will all be obsessed with this time of year, holiday movies. And she's really good at them. <laughs> we break down why they're so darn addicting. Stay with us. <laughs> A ride share? No, I didn't think I ordered that either. Um, I, I can just shove these down here. They'll be, they'll be fine for a few minutes. Everyone good? Good. Good? Good. It's a good thing you didn't have more of these. Wings? Oh, is that what they are? Don't tell me you've never donned a pair of wings before. Not since kindergarten. Really? Me neither. We're back with Tony and Emmy Award winning actress Kristen Chenoweth. That was a clip from our Hallmark movie, A Christmas Love Story. Now, I noticed this year holiday movies are rolling out even before Halloween had occurred. Mm -hmm. right? and now everyone's binge watching them. Why is it that we all adore these holiday movies? I don't know. In a Hallmark, nobody does Christmas better than Hallmark. It's like Christmas threw up, you know, for two months on <laughs> Hallmark. But I think holiday in general just makes you feel good. I mean, no matter, you know? So A Christmas Love Story, without giving it all away, yeah. why is it so addictive? Well, Christmas Love Story stars myself and Scott Wolf, and Scott Wolf's eyes is n the number one reason to watch the movie yes. because they're so beautiful. Yeah. Um, it is a obviously it centers around a love story, but it is a first time that Hallmark has um, uh, 
tackled th this subject matter, which is very, very close to my heart, which I can't give away. So I hope that y'all will tune in and, and watch it, part of my, my history. And I wrote the title song with my buddy Shelly Wright for it, Oh, too. it's perfect. Yeah. A double dose of you. A double. All right, so let's break down the science of why holiday movies are so addictive. Because okay. it's been studied, because we all acknowledge it, and it's part of the culture. So my med team broke down the formula. First, renewal of spirit. Good example, Scrooge. You know, you got to change a heart, right? Yes. It actually benefits your actual heart. They did studies on this. So how do you renew your spirit? Because you go through a lot and ups and downs happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, thank, first of all, thank you for asking me because I want people to understand that I know that I, I'm very grateful and thankful for my life. But if I have a bad day, first of all I do is I let myself have a bad day. If I'm having a bad moment, I go, okay, I'm going to have this moment and then I'm going to move on. I'm going to go to Baskin Robbins, I'm going to get an ice cream cone, <laughs> and I'm going to call my mom because my mom is the one that keeps saying, my mom keeps saying, Kristen, so many people struggle, you have a good life you just keep going forward and being happy just do it mom for all the folks in norman oklahoma we're giving you a big kiss from the stage i here. love you mom i miss you <laughs> so second part of the formula uh -huh. i'm putting it up behind the prescription guys it's a touch of romance like in kristen's latest movie with scott wolf right there's a love that occurs and when that love happens you release dopamine dopamine hits your brain gives you a heightened sense of happiness a sense of fulfillment do you believe in happily ever after heck yeah you do? Heck yeah, I do. I mean, I, I, that doesn't mean to say that I think that everything's perfect. I am still that little girl from Oklahoma. I'm still little, actually, but I'm still <laughs> that girl from Oklahoma that thinks, yes, happily ever after exists. All right, come on over. It's part three of the okay. formula. Is you need a sprinkle of magic, right? Oh, I love this. Like, you know, like Santa or how about snow? You want some snow? Oh, I love snow. No, let's go into the snow. Oh, there it is. Oh. Oh, and you put on God. romance, renewal of the spirit, and a sprinkle of magic. Oh, a little scarf. Thank you so a little much. scarf. I right love at this. It. The only thing we need to really make this magic is hot chocolate. Is there any hot oh, chocolate? Please. This will really make the magic. Oh, Renny, thank you oh, very much. Are you oh. serious? And we can toast this. I love you dearly. I love you. Now we got magic. Oh, I'm happy. Oh, oh. And snow. And it's good. Check out Kristen Chenowitz. I know it's hot. She did a Christmas love story on the Hallmark Channel Saturday, December 7th. Tune in and don't miss her in Christmas with the Tabernacle Choir on PBS and BYU TV. We'll be right back. Woo! When you think of dry skin, dry skin, what comes to mind? Is it skin that looks like an alligator? All right, be honest. Or how about skin that feels tight like someone's pulling at it all the time, right? Or skin that sheds and flakes like crazy, right? We've all been there. Today, what state is your dry skin in? I want to tell you about my dry skin. It started on the back of my legs. I was so embarrassed to go to gym because you can see the dry skin. Then it went to my hands and couldn't hide that. When the weather gets colder, uh, when it gets drier, I get really dry skin right up on my upper arms and my elbows get really flaky. My ankles, like they get really itchy. I just want to scratch them and I come home at the end of the day. I have two areas that are extremely dry and I'm wondering if you can help me. I need a lot of creams in winter months or anytime and I'm in a cold climate. No matter what you attribute your dry skin to, it could be the changes in the weather, your hormones, long hot showers, I love those. The skin you inherited from your parents are just getting older. They all tell us one thing about your skin, water loss. So to tell us more, I brought in board certified dermatologist, Dr. Elizabeth Tanzi, who's here on behalf of my trusted sponsorship partner, Eucerin. So what does your skin tell you about water loss? So, hi, Dr. Ross. So all those things, all those factors you just mentioned can lead to water loss through the skin and it ends up leaving the skin feeling dry and uncomfortable. So dry skin can be related to somewhat of a lack of natural hydrating components in the skin that act like sponges mm -hmm. to help hold the hydration into the skin. But it also can be related to somewhat of a lack of a deficiency in the skin oils that help to create the, the moisture barrier in the skin to help retain water. Now over time, as we're losing water through the skin, that moisture barrier becomes weakened, and then as we lose more and more water, 
the dry skin condition gets worse. It's a vicious cycle. Yes, it is. Um, it wouldn't be quite the same if we didn't do a demonstration to actually show what you're speaking to. So water loss happens because you get a little bit of a, your skin, which is not naturally has a barrier that keeps it moist, as you mentioned before. But when you experience dry skin, guess what happens? All of a sudden, this beautiful and permeable skin starts to yield water. It begins to evaporate through the skin, leaving that skin super, super dry. Right? This is all the moisture. See it escaping there? Yeah, right. you don't want that. So what's the solution? But when you use a therapeutic lotion, you can literally lock that hydration into the skin and strengthen the skin barrier to prevent future dryness. Now, this is fantastic. However, some lotions will stop here. But you really do want to take it one step further and look for a product that has natural moisturizing factors because those moisturizing factors act like little sponges within the skin mm -hmm. to help hold on and retain that hydration and give you even more of a moisture, moisture boost. I see it happening here. Mm -hmm. It's that plumpness that you want there. And that plumpness that you can sort of see happening in the, as this, these sponges enlarge here, it's something that you desire that you can't see from on top of the skin, but it's there. It gives you that nice bounciness. The skin doesn't feel so pulled over. Right. It helps with the comfort of the skin and hydrates the skin and holds it in there. And it retains the moisture, too. May I assist you, doctor? Yes, thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so there are lots of different ways of doing this. What do you recommend to alleviate what we just witnessed here? Any drying of the skin, evaporation of fluid, further drying of the skin, that vicious cycle downwards, and reverse it in the way you just described it with a nice, elegant lotion or cream with a plumping from the inside again. All right. So I am a very big fan of Eucerin's Advanced Repair Lotion and Cream because they have that unique combination of not only the ceramides that help to retain and improve the moisture barrier of the skin, but also natural moisturizing factors that act like the sponges to help boost the hydration within the skin. And it's really the combination of those two that make it so effective. So it Im immediately improves dry skin, it feels better right away, mm -hmm. but also there's a long lasting hydration. In fact, Eucerin did a clinical study with the Advanced Repair Lotion, and what they showed was that even a single application of Eucerin Advanced Repair can give you long-lasting hydration up to 48 hours. So I decided to put it to the test. We asked two of my viewers, Mariana and Audrey, to join us. They had been struggling with their dry skin. They wanted to test out Eucerin's Advanced Repair and then report back to us. So you yes. both did it, and yes. I appreciate you trusting the system and actually yeah. doing it even more than once. You did it for enough time that you could speak to it with some experience. So mm -hmm. what do you treat your dry skin to, Mariana? Um, when the weather gets cold, it gets dry. My legs get itchy, flaky. I run around in tights all day um, in the city, and that just leaches all the moisture out of my skin and lack of sleep. <laughs> All right, so you took a picture, which you were kind enough to share with us. Mm -hmm. This is what Mariana's skin looked like before using Eucerin's Advanced Repair Lotion. And again, you used the lotion, and this is Mariana's mm -hmm. skin today. You notice the dryness there, right? But here, I mean, I've got to, you speak to it. What is it like? Yeah. Describe <laughs> the difference you see in your skin. Well, yeah. <laughs> The skin was very flaky, dry. I was constantly like scratching at my ankles. And then afterwards, it felt smooth, soft, hydrated, and it felt comfortable throughout the day. And Audrey, your skin looked like this. I'll share a short picture that you gave to us. Here's your skin beforehand. And then I took a picture of you after using your use and repair cream. Yes. Right. Oh, much better. How does it feel different? When you, when you see this, what goes through your mind? Wow, what a difference. That's what goes through my mind. Wow, unbelievable. My skin is shouting out, wow, I feel nourished and smooth. And I use the cream, and I like something that's rich and thick. And for me, that's what really worked. So when you put it on, you felt that, and you enjoyed that sensation? I felt it, and I enjoyed it very much. All right, so Dr. Tanzi, Mariana mentioned that she used a lotion, and Audrey mentioned using yes. a cream. So describe the difference between the two. So when it comes to using a therapeutic lotion or cream, it really comes down to personal preference on the texture because both are equally effective. So if you prefer a lotion, Eucerin's Advanced Repair Lotion is a light feeling formulation that absorbs quickly and it's a very popular formulation. Because they did a survey that looked at almost 900 people that were given the product and 99% of them would recommend the product. So the, you're, you're in good company. <laughs> <laughs>
But if you like, if you like a cream, yes, then you want something that has a richer feel on the skin and yes. maybe you can feel it all day there. So it's, it's personal preference on what you're gonna use. Or if you're like me, I wash my hands a lot during the day as a, as a physician. So I have the um, Advanced Repair hand cream mm -hmm. that is non-greasy, mm -hmm. it absorbs quickly, and it's got shea butter, so I love that too. All right, so no matter what your texture preference is, our trusted sponsor partner, Usurin, has something for you. Because beginning tomorrow at 12 p.m. Eastern time, listen carefully, the first 5,000 people to go to DrOz.com will receive a coupon for one free Usurin Advanced Repair Lotion or Cream. Pick and choose. And you know what, we can't stop there. My entire studio audience, you're all going home with a bottle of Usurin's Advanced Repair Body Lotion. Enjoy it, share it. We'll be right back. Taking a look at the inspirational story of Kalen Bennett. Now, Kalen Bennett never walked until the age of four and didn't speak until the age of seven. But today, he's a college basketball player for Kent State and continues to turn heads. Take a look. Freshman Kalen Bennett became the first person with autism to sign a letter of intent to play for a Division I sports program. He would make his basketball debut, scoring two points during Kent State's first season game. Kalen Bennett says, I hope I created a thing that's going to transcend to more kids so they believe in themselves first and foremost. Joining us today is the athlete who keeps defying the odds, Kalen Bennett and Kent State coach Sender Roth. Thanks for both being here. Kalen, how does it feel to suit up and actually put points on the board? That was a nice shot. Feels good, man. Feels good going out there, having a good time with my teammates, good time for the fans. It was a lot of fun. The Coach Senderoff, how has Kalen's presence added to the Kent State basketball program? You're a Division I program. You need good players. Yeah. Well, we, we, he certainly has brought uh, a big presence to the team. He's continuing to work every day to continue to try to have an impact on our program. So, Kalen, your unrelenting drive, your perseverance is so admirable. I'm just curious. I heard a little bit about your grandmother. What does she teach you? My grandma, first of all, my grandma is a huge fan of yours. <laughs> uh, but uh, my grandma has instilled in me and my mom the word can't, can't be used in the house. So when we go out and we do stuff that's new or we do stuff repetitively, we got to at least give it a try. We never know if we can do it or can't do it at all. Well, you tell that wonderful woman who I understand used to watch the show with you when you're still back at home that she's always welcome to come visit with me. We'll put her in the front row. You got me? Yes, sir. All right. Everyone, the power of change lies in the power of you. Just one person with one voice speaking the truth. Kaylin, your journey is a testament to the strength of your spirit. God bless you. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>